Hello, hello, and welcome to Reading by the Moon. I am Josephine Moon, and tonight we are delighted to have with us beautiful Jessica Detman, who is the author of This Has Been Absolutely Lovely. Thank you for joining us, Jessica. Thank you so much for having me. We are just so excited to talk about this book, so we're really happy that you're here. Jessica is joining us from Sydney today, where she has been out marching in the marches for justice on the streets of Sydney. We are all wearing black uh, to show our solidarity for those marches as well. And while that's been a, a difficult day for many people and quite sad for many people, um, we know that in life we often have to do two things at once and we are also going to celebrate Jessica's book tonight. And I can't think of a better thing to be doing today, really, than hanging out with all you fabulous women, talking about a book about female characters and about women's lives. So I think that seems quite perfect for today. Jessica, if you have not yet come across her, she used to be an editor at Random House and HarperCollins before turning her craft to writing for herself. And her first book was How to Be Second Best and... This book is her second uh, novel. And this book is about primarily two women, Annie, who is in her late 50s and who's, who is now free of sort of responsibilities to, for ageing parents and her children are grown up and they're building their own families. And her youngest daughter, Molly, who is in her late 20s, who is pregnant for the first time and all of the family, and it's a it's a cast of many many people in uh this, that come together in this one house over the sort of season of christmas one year and as i'm sure anybody who's spent christmas with a whole bunch of family and extended family can attest to uh not everybody gets on well the whole time and tensions and secrets start to come to the fore i wanted to start right off by saying well first of all you're, you're a brilliant writer jessica you really uh have such a a skillful way with words. I was many, many times just going, wow, that's such a great sentence. That's such a great description. It was, you really have that down pat. So well done to you. Thanks. Um, but I wanted to talk about Molly because <laughs> Annie starts off this book being, I think, fairly harsh towards her youngest child and says, you know, she's the fly in the ointment. She, she really, I think, is very, very hard on Molly. And I kept sort of waiting, I guess, for Molly to be this sort of, uh, to live up to that sort of bad reputation that her mother mm. has sort of formed in her head. And I, I actually had an awful lot of sympathy for Molly. Um, first of all, I'd sort of like to know, because I know as a writer, you don't necessarily think the same way about other characters as other characters think about those characters. So I'd be interested to know, in your mind, was Molly deserving of Annie's wrath? Or, well, no, it's not really rap, but her judgment. Uh, yeah. Or do you think there's something else going on there? That's a really good question. It's making me think about those characters in a way I hadn't really before. I think that probably, no, she wasn't deserving of that. I think that what that is, is Annie expressing her fear, um, her fears for Molly. When You know, when... A, when someone worries you, it's easy to just find them annoying. And and she, I think she worries a lot that Molly won't find her way easily and that she will continue to be needy, more needy than Annie wants and is prepared um, to kind of continue to be throughout her life. Yeah. Uh, I think she's just been sort of waiting for that, you know, to be able to let go of the bike with Molly, but she keeps having to grab her and help her. But, she, but you know, does she is the question or is that just some ingrained thinking from childhood and maybe some guilt as well? I think she feels pretty guilty that Molly um, got the kind of short end of the father stick <laughs> once her father and um, her mother had split up. You know, she was the littlest. There was quite a big age gap between the second and third and, um, you know, while Annie was okay with the relationship ending, I think she just sort of wished that it was easier for Molly and doesn't really know how to process that or deal with that. Yeah. It's interesting. There's a, there's a lot of sort of discussion of, of the fact that Molly keeps changing jobs mm. and sort of doesn't stick with anything. And 
for me personally, I was going, that was me. That was me in my 20s. I was doing a bit of this and a bit of that and I was changing careers all over the shop. And I'm sure yeah. my parents were like, man, just pick it, pick something and stick yeah. with it, you know. Yeah, I think it's very normal, but I yes. can't quite get her head around it. Yeah, I think she's just, you know, late 20s is, um, yeah, you're still really finding your feet in the world there. And I think um, in some of the conversations I had, because I, uh, looked at this book in my in-person book club where we get together with cocktails and cheese and discuss the book and then with other conversations online with people. Um, you know, there was sort of a lot of discussion of, oh, well, she's, she's pregnant and she kind of didn't really want to be pregnant. Now she's changing her mind if she wants to be pregnant. And I kept thinking, well, I don't know, you know, I think a lot of women would find themselves in that position of going, well, we thought it would take longer, but it didn't, or we yeah. thought it would happen straight away and it didn't, or we thought it would happen at all and it never did. Like you can never know when exactly. that's going to happen or if it's going to happen and, and if you're ready sort of at that time and you're going to freak out along the way and go, oh, man, I can't do this. Yeah, I really wanted to explore that concept of maternal ambivalence, which actually both of them, like both Annie and Molly are experiencing maternal ambivalence just at, you know, one is about an unborn child and one is about three born children born and grown children they're both just kind of like oh, is this what I want how is this forever how long will this be for and yeah that panic um I, I mean I hope other people found that familiar that sort of push and pull when you're pregnant of oh, this is what I wanted so much what have I done <laughs> simultaneously yeah yeah, yeah. all right it's, it's a it's a massive um yeah, it's a massive life-changing thing that you can't mm. possibly prepare for at all. I do, you, yeah, you've you've um you've just made me remember that too about Annie, that she sort of she kind of felt like that at the beginning with her kids and she sort of still feels like that, you know, 30 yeah. odd years on. And, you know, and maybe that is some people's journey. And but yeah, it, that that you I mean it really nails that sort of idea of that mothering sort of never finishes, that it's yeah, it changes maybe. And now that I think about it, there's probably some transference of um, feelings from what Annie experienced because her first baby wasn't planned mm. necessarily. You know, she and her husband, her partner, yeah, they were they married? Yeah, I think they were married when they got pregnant. Yes, they were. Um, no, they weren't. They got married just before Eurovision. That's right. She was heavily pregnant. Um, yeah, that baby wasn't planned. And she wasn't quite sure about it. And she, I think she throws a lot of those thoughts into what she imagines Molly is going through as well, which is not exactly the same as what Molly's having. But, you know, there are similarities. Yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't actually made that connection that she was projecting the same <laughs> stuff. Yeah. No, I mean, I totally did that on purpose. <laughs> it's all part of the craft. It was very clever. You're really, really clever. <laughs> um, I know uh, Mary Lou is our resident muso here, so she'll have some music questions for you. But before, And I'm sure I, I've got music questions too, and I'm sure mine are very different. So I do want to ask you a little bit about, about yeah. the music because music plays such a big part of this story from the first page right to the last. Um, and some of it feels quite technical in its description as well. So I wanted to ask you what your sort of experience with music is. I think that the saying that some of it feels quite technical, I think there's one technical bit. There's a bit where it mentions parallel thirds. Yeah, my editor wrote that, that sentence. <laughs> <laughs> because I don't know anything about music at all. Um, and certainly not how to sound like somebody who does know about music. So, yes, I did um, when I, I don't know what possessed me to write a character who's a songwriter um, when I don't know anything about how to talk about music, but I just sort of figured that it was a similar process to writing anything, you know, that yeah. you, and it's, it is something I'm curious about. Like I love music. I'm, you know, I have, really daggy taste in music it's not very far off Annie's yeah. kind of music um and I just wanted to explore the ideas behind writing a song because I've always wondered about when you're writing a song how do you know you're not writing a song someone else has already written yeah. like it's a little bit it's a bit similar to writing books where you know you'll be plotting something and you'll be like oh no that's I know yeah. that book I know this that story I've just tried to make up that's already written um but you know there are only a finite number of stories and songs have structure and you know things that make them into what they are and then there's variation within that that makes it a distinctive piece of music and 
and I yeah so I just sort of freewheeled my way through writing most of the musical stuff um but then I did have a friend um Meg Washington the singer um is a friend and she I sent her a bunch of questions and she answered them and that was after I'd finished the first draft and so I could work in a little bit more of um the process that she talked about to me yeah well it sounds from uh, I'm a music enjoyer but not a you know I, I did a little bit of music at school but nothing like that and it, it, it really sounded convincing to me and I thought wow this is really um and I really enjoyed that uh aspect I could see a lot of that sort of process that you were describing or Annie was describing in terms of writing a novel as well exactly. yeah I think yeah. there must be so many similarities yeah yeah just that like the way inspiration follows you around and then you know if you lose your train of thought it's really hard to get back and all again. Yeah, all of those sorts Little of things that just nag at you and stay with you, and you don't really know what to do with them until you find another bit, and then you pull them together. And yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think you did a really good job of that. Um, I am going to cross over to Mari Louise, who has questions for you about grandparenting. <laughs> Hi, <Mary Louise. laughs> Hi, Jessica. It was such a great book. First of all, thank you so much. I laughed so much oh, I really really enjoyed it it was fabulous some yeah characters were just um just yeah very real and really some of them quite awful and very <laughs> amusing in their, in their awfulness and I'm trying to remember what my question was about um, um about you parenting. had ideas about parental bonds and grandparenting grandparents parenting their grandkids oh yes yeah, because I was actually thinking in my head what I was going to ask about was the invisible load and to talk about that. But yes, it, I was I was also very interested in, in that sort of um, how you came about talking about that responsibility somehow that we seem to have in our minds of grandparents now being responsible for looking after their yeah. grandchildren while their children go back to work. Because I, I actually know of quite a few friends of mine who are now looking after grandchildren. Um, and working yeah um, yeah well that um that came about the same way for me really I started to um I can't see you what have I done there you are um I started to have my mum report to me all about all these friends of hers I don't you know and I'd also see my friends parents at school gate and stuff doing pickups like four or five times a week and, and especially I remember hearing about a friend of my mum's whose daughter is like a really busy corporate lawyer and someone I grew up with and she has three kids and her mum was doing four full days a week looking after them from about six months old. Oh, she was yeah. doing like 8 a.m. starts till 7 or 8 in the evening. I just... I was blown away by that and you know that when you've got little kids and you're just in the in the shit with it and really exhausted all the time I just thought I, I can't wait for this part to be over like I, I'm, I'm much happier when they're bigger and more interesting and they can talk to you more I can't I can't get my head around someone asking me to do this again when I'm 20 or 30 years older and I'm absolutely like I think I'm tired now what's it going to feel like when I'm 60 that was my yeah. fear yeah. um so yeah I wanted to explore that a bit and um, also the the issue about how if you end up being like a default parent to a child you don't get to do any of the fun grandparenting stuff you know you have to be the bad cop and make them eat their vegetables and you know um basically just not be the treaty one which I think is part of what you've earned as a grandparent if possible you get to just be the kind of swing in swing out do all the fun stuff guy yeah yeah the lollies yeah go back to mum <laughs> yeah do all the things your kids don't want you to do you know let the baby sleep on its front and all that stuff <laughs> <laughs> that's what we did it was fine, yeah, it was fine. you were all fine <laughs> I mean I, I did think it was really um you know interesting that um Annie was so anti the idea of of potentially having to to look after Molly's baby and and that idea that that was going to be her responsibility mm. when Annie had obviously 
given her children to her mum to look after. Yeah, well, she does. She does sort of wrestle with that a bit occasionally, where yeah. she's like, "Oh, yeah, I did make, I did take all of this from my mother, but now it's not what I want." Yeah. Um, yeah, but I think there's no rule that you have to do. You know, as as Molly, the conclusion Molly comes to at one point is that you don't have to live the life your parents lived, and so likewise, she feels <laughs> Annie feels like it's. It's tough to be the one who breaks the cycle of like being a helpful person, but yeah. <laughs> prepared to do it <laughs> so she can go off and have some fun. Because she's also been that sandwich person stuck between children and, and ageing parents. And, you know, parents sort of had five year long illnesses in sequence. And then, so she gave them basically 10 years and then is just, just done. Like she's just cared out. Yeah, who's I caring? Think, I think that's so clear. It's so clear. She's just absolutely just done with anybody else taking from her. Yeah. yeah. But, but I, I, I wanted really... to make her not, like, hate her grandchildren. So I think, yeah. you know, it was important that she has a really good relationship with those two bigger grandchildren, the six-year-olds, yeah. Um, yeah. but that just not a really aggressively intense one, mm. more of a holiday kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's just, um, yeah, that whole conversation has just made me think about about Annie in that situation, as you were saying, that she's just exhausted from all this caring and that that's often what happens. The carers don't get any care. Like who's yeah. caring for Annie? Who's looking after Annie? Who's yeah. docking Annie's well? And, and now that I think about it, kind of the only thing Annie has going for her in that sense is that she doesn't have a husband who yeah. she's going to have to look after, after all this. <laughs> <laughs> she can pay attention to herself which was you know one of the reasons that um a love story for annie you know wasn't i'm not doing spoilers am i no sorry never mind <laughs> <laughs> it's your book you can spoil it if you want to That's all good. <laughs> um we're going to come back to uh, slight reveals a bit later but i will pop over to kanina kanina is our guest panelist tonight is joining us for the first time hey, kanina. Um, Hi. And so Kanina's got some questions for you too. Hey Jess, and congratulations. As you know, I've posted about this. I love, I both love this book and your first book. You've been a great supporter. Thank you. <laughs> I think one of the best things that you do is that um, you draw the reader straight in from the very first page. I both With both books, I felt like I was sinking into your story straight away with a kind of contentment and like an excitement that you're in for a treat you know when you just get one of those books that you're just like ah I'm so excited about oh, this so nice to hear <laughs> so I want to know um what your process is for getting down that first page so at what stage did this first page come and how do you decide what to kick your story off with so with my first book the first page as it is printed is almost 100% the first page of fiction I ever wrote. Like, I that just was blah, 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 out it came, ready to go. This one, this one, not the same. Um, this had a prologue for a long time that was sort of all about Annie and the band getting together uh, and then that's been hacked up and interspersed throughout the book on the very wise advice of my publisher. Um, so this, yeah, this first page came about reasonably late, like about halfway through. The first draft was really weird because I couldn't decide who was telling the story. I kind of knew the story-ish and I knew a bit the characters, but I couldn't decide if it was just Annie or just Molly or both of them or first person or third person or past tense or present tense. And so I did all of those combinations about six times going back and forth, spent about four months doing that. It was really painful experience for everyone who knows me or lives with me. Um, so, yeah, and eventually I got to the idea of the earworm and that, once I had that, it kind of was easier to, to thread everything else through that lens at the beginning. Uh, but it's interesting that you say that you found it captivating from the beginning because 
um, I'm, I'm really keen on reading all the criticism of my book as um, it's really, really good for your mental health. Yeah, um, I did. <laughs> You don't know what I mean at all, do you? Um, but yes, a lot like the the main criticism I've found is people being like, "Oh, it's such a slow start," and I occasionally did feel that too, and I sped it up as much as I could. But I was very aware that it takes a good, you know, forty five pages to leave the fir the first scene of that book. Really, I think it's got a good feeling though. Okay, that's good. If not, maybe pace. But yeah. Now, when you're saying that you're deciding between Molly, Annie, first person, third person, yeah. do you think that had anything to do with it being your second book? And it, you yeah, were, I think so. That was playing on your mind at all? Yeah, it was because the first book is in first person present tense, and uh, I felt like I shouldn't do that again because I would find it hard not to write the same voice I was kind of terrified of writing anything different also this was the first time I'd written anything in the third person because everything I've written before is a blog post basically um so that was it was a big learning experience for me to try and write something in the third person and I thought oh okay, a second book you know challenge yourself a bit more yeah I write that. I'm not doing that again <laughs> I'll challenge you myself. Take the easy road from now on. No, no. <laughs> First person all the way. I was noting before that you're um the the back behind you there in the background, you have uh, this beautiful indoor plant which matches kind of the theme on the back cover of your book. And there's the photo plant there on the front. And uh, I was saying it's, it's so on trend right now. As soon as I picked up this book, it was the first thing I noticed. I thought Darren went, oh, look, it's so on trend. It's so, so 2020. <laughs> It's gorgeous. The colour on it, it's just beautiful. Yeah, it's lovely. I'm really yeah. happy with that. Well, for a book you were terrified about writing, you it certainly come off really well. So yeah, thank you. It's done now. You've done your second book syndrome book. It's done. And you can just relax now. It just gets easier. Every yeah, yeah, that's what I've heard. Just the mm. rest, they come so easily after that. Oh, totally. Yeah, just <laughs> pop them out. No problem. <laughs> Um, we're going to pop over, popping over. We'll pop over to Mary Lou now, who will have some music questions for you. Yeah, let's pop over for a nice cup of tea. Um, I'm wondering, Jessica, are you a fan of Euro Eurovision? Yes, bits of it. I like. Um, I don't usually watch the whole thing every year, um, but I did. I kind of like old Eurovision. Um, I what when I was working at Random House years ago. Um, a guy who was one of the commentators for SBS at the time of Eurovision, Des Mangan, wrote a book about Eurovision um, that needed a lot of work. So I did a lot of research about Eurovision and I just kind of learnt all this random trivia about it, none of which I'm consciously able to bring back now, but I kind of I spent, this, you know, a month or two just engrossed in Eurovision stuff. And, and I love ABBA. And I went to the ABBA Museum a couple of years ago in um, Stockholm. And, yeah, that just, so, yes, yes, I'm a Eurovision fan, I would say. Yeah. I, I was wondering because the stuff about Eurovision, even though it's not dominant, it's there and that underlying yeah. theme is there all the way through it. And so I was wondering, and now it makes sense, you, you have this knowledge in your mind that... Deep that, down, yeah. Yeah, that, that's come <laughs> through and imbued the book. Now, you say that um, you don't know anything about writing music and all that kind of stuff, yeah. and yet you chose this character. She plays the piano. She's got these ideas in her head. She's writing these songs. Did you ever hear them? In your no, mind? no. I had no, no. And I had this idea at the beginning that every chapter I would introduce, um, you know, with a few lines of um, her lyrics. But I couldn't even do that. I can't even write song lyrics. Like I wrote, there are two song lyrics at the, oh, no, there's six lines of one song at the beginning as a sort of epigraph from the hits, their hit song. Um, but, no, apart from that, I, I, there's no songs, no real songs in my head that I could hear. Wow. That's really interesting. And occasionally I've heard um, something like a new song recently and gone, oh, that could have been the kind of thing that Annie played that could be that sort of song and especially when I hear pop songs now um, and think about what happens when you sort of 
go back from the highly produced pop song to what somebody would have initially played on the piano that's when I think about what her songs might have sounded like like when I the Taylor Swift documentary that was recently on about her making epiphany or folklore I can't remember which one but one of the two one of the two incredible albums that she put out during COVID um there's and there's a documentary on Disney I think which is just her playing that whole album and discussing making the songs um and that yeah I watched that afterwards and was like oh yeah you know some of those could be songs that Annie could have worked on. So how did Megan Washington help you in the writing of the book specifically? Um, I, I just sent her a list of questions about her process and you know it was probably five or six questions and she wrote me back a few lines on each and they just kind of confirmed that what I had imagined to be the case was the case about how you write a song and I listened to some um, you know songwriting podcasts and a few other bits and pieces while I was writing so I sort of thought I was on the right track with that. Um, you definitely are I think it's amazing for someone who's never written a song and who didn't hear the songs in her head the music comes through and I I used to be a songwriter and I thought you handled it really, really well. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I'm amazed that you're not a songwriter at all. So well done. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I agree. It was it was very alive, the music on mm. the page. Well, another musician um, said it was the only, told me it was the only uh, depiction of songwriting he's ever read that didn't make him want to throw up. <laughs> <laughs> I was pretty chuffed about that. <laughs> Glowing endorsement, absolutely yeah. glowing. <laughs> um, I'm going to swap uh, topics here over to, this is, we don't try not to give away spoilers, this is a tiny spoilerish kind of area. Mm. There's a, 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 a serious uh, event and moment in this book relating to postnatal depression, which uh, caused a lot of discussion in, in both of my sort of book club groups as well. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how that came to be part of the book? Mm. Um, I needed something dramatic at a point in this book and I needed it to happen to one of the characters in particular and it felt like a really natural fit and, it, and I experienced postnatal depression twice um, after each of my kids' births and I hadn't, I'd written about it a bit, I'd written about it a bit on my blog um, and I kind of wanted to go back and and get that down for posterity as well you know it's um some of the feelings that she has are things that I felt and I think I'm you know pretty common to people who go through that um yeah so I, I just wanted to hmm. do something quite terrifying yeah because I I when I read that um I also had postnatal depression so and I understand how suddenly it can happen yeah and for me there was uh there was that moment uh there's a moment <laughs> after the baby in question has been born and uh the mother looks down at the baby and suddenly says suddenly realizes oh god I've brought you into the most horrible world <laughs> like the world is the planet's melting everything's violent wow. everything you know this and I, I, I've had that moment with uh, my son, not sort of straight after birth, but at some point when there was a lot of things going on and I was going through a lot of pain and I remember just thinking, oh, this is terrible. I've just con consigned this beautiful human to all of this. This uh, planet. This pain, yeah. And it's like it's a, such a complicated thing. But my, I, in, when I got to that moment, though, with that, I sort of thought back over that character's presence on the page and I thought, I feel like maybe she was actually a little bit depressed the whole way through and it yeah. sort of exploded. Yeah. That is the case. Mm. I, I, think, I think Molly's never never quite felt right. Yeah, I could really see that. I, yeah. I could really empathise with it. I have, I, I have a lot of sympathy for Molly. I really do. Yeah, because it feeds, it comes out of all of the things we know about her. Mm. that she can't quite find her place and she clings on to people and then she um, clings on but then discards them just as quickly. Yeah. And she's just searching for something really solid that she doesn't feel she has and then all of a sudden it's like the music stops with this yeah. and she's just terrified. 
yeah yeah it was done beautifully it really was um yeah I could just see it I just I could just see that so clearly you did an amazing job on that I think and uh it's yeah it's something that's still a little bit taboo to talk about and I think so yeah just a little bit it's getting better I, but I, I think can't, it's still I can't say I'd love my kids to read this bit <laughs> <laughs> like, is that you no no I don't know <laughs> don't know anything about that no all good yeah, you did a really, really good job on that. So well done. Yeah, Joe, you sound a bit, uh, you were angry before at Annie too. You must feel very sympathetic for Molly. Yeah. Angry, angry at, Mo <laughs> at Annie for giving Molly a hard time. Yeah, I kind of wasn't to start with, but as, as the book went on, I started to get more and more kind of like, oh, okay, Annie, I think you're missing. Yeah, I think Annie's been a pretty bad mum to Molly mm -hmm. overall. Like she's just sort of always found her a bit of a pest and mm. that's, that's not going to make you grow up feeling good no and not. safe in the world and happy yeah it's complex isn't it yeah it's complex it is. there's a lot of layers going on in this book yeah lots and lots does right look our chats just go so fast honestly so i'm just going to ask everyone if there's any other questions that people have that are burning to be asked at this moment Okay. Um, yes. Yeah. I was going to say, with both your books, they're very witty and sharp. So I'm wondering if funny is your first instinct when you're writing. And do you sometimes have to force yourself to pair it back and maybe look at a different emotional truth? That's a really good question. The first book, uh, there was, it was just full on like lols and lols easily to the point that my editor was like, you know, let's just kind of cut down on the gag count a bit um this one it was it wasn't funny at all for ages and ages and the first draft my editor my publisher read it and was like we've branded you we've branded you as funny <laughs> this is miserable <laughs> can you kind of perk it up a bit um and then and then you so said the second pass through I did um pump up the, the laughs a bit intentionally um so I I and I, I sort of I said to someone I think I've lost the ability to write funny and they said or well, maybe you've found the ability to write serious yeah yeah it's not a nice yeah. way of putting it yeah I think it's incredibly difficult to write humor so oh yeah. so it's very, I think it's really challenging. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was sort of, it did feel weird to try to consciously make something more funny. Yeah. When, um, you know, really, it wasn't a very funny situation that any of them were in. Yeah. But, but character comedy makes that a bit easier, I think. You can just have people snarking at each other and that's always a bit of a laugh. Yeah, we can get away with it, I think, when it's siblings and close family like that. Like, if, yeah. yeah, if it was a bunch of friends, you'd be a bit more like, oh, geez. A bunch of fun. friends, if it was, like, people in a romantic relationship, it yes. would be awful, the things that they say to each other. But, yeah, siblings, you get a fair bit of leeway, I think. Yeah, I agree. That's awesome. It has been so great to have you on the show. And oh, thank, thank you for writing this fabulous it. book for us all to chat about. Was that someone else with a question? Sorry. No? Sorry, I just had double audio going on there. Um, so, we, yeah, thank you so much for writing this great book. It's been absolutely awesome. This is the time of night where we ask people to tell us, ask our panellists to tell us what they're reading. And Jessica, if you are reading something at the moment and you would like to share it, you're welcome to do that. I'll give you a minute to think about that, if you like, while we go to everybody else. Um, Maria Louise, what are you reading at the moment? I am reading The Dictionary of Lost Words. So good. So good. Um, I'm not very far into it, but yeah, really, really, really good. I read, oh, well, I listened to that one on audio, but often many times I wished I could see how it was on the page. I'm not, um, I don't listen to books. I have to read them. I'm so old school and it's beautiful. Definitely probably worth reading again, just to go and just to look at it. Yeah. I also listened to that one on audio, Kanina. I thought it was yeah. It was amazing. It was mind blowing. Yeah. Every chapter it was just mind blowing. Yeah, I loved it too. Yeah. Kanina, what are you reading at the moment? Oh, well, I've got a stack of few because we're reading Harry Potter again. So I'm that far from the end with my son. So he's very intense about that. I've just finished Firefly Lane because I always like to read a book before I watch it. 
the TV adaptation and I'm about to start Ali Sinclair's The Code Breakers, which I think you've got Ali on later in the year. Yeah, I've got a, I've got that sitting waiting to uh, <laughs> jump up the pile as well. I can't wait to have Ali on. It's got, everyone's raving about it. It's got great reviews. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Mary Lou, what are you reading? Uh, I just finished reading The Sea of Waking Dreams, Richard Flanagan, for my other book club. And, um, yeah, not up to his usual brilliance, I don't think, but fascinating, lots of different levels going on. And at the moment I'm reading The River Runs Free, Exploring and Defending Tasmania's Wilderness. It sounds really dry. <clears throat> Excuse me, I had to get this. It's out of print. I had to get it secondhand and it came with the Waverley Library <laughs> sticker <laughs> on it. So there you go. Um, yeah, it's out of print. I wish it wasn't. It's just a fascinating look at the um, Franklin blockade. And just warts and all from Jeff Law, who did all the uh, um, marketing and publicity for it. Even though he knew nothing about marketing and publicity, he certainly learnt a lot. It's warts and all, it's funny, it's serious, it's heartbreaking, and it's sadly out of print. Oh. Jessica, what are you reading? Um, I just last night finished uh, this, which I read on my phone. You probably can't see it. It's called Don't Be a Dick, Pete. <laughs> And it's by Stuart Heritage, who's a freelance journalist in the UK. And it's just this amazing memoir of his relationship with his little brother, Pete, um, who, you know, Stuart is three years older and is the, the prince of the family. And Pete is just this sort of whirlwind of a kid who has chronic eczema and is really violent and they grow up to be just the most different kind of people and it's about their relationship as adults and um, and how that works. And it's really funny. It's one of the, it's just hilariously funny in parts it's, and it's really sad as well. Oh, sounds great. I'll have to look out for that. I am also a very dedicated audio listener, so I have to hold up my phone as well. I'm just started listening to one of Kimberly Freeman's books. I've read most of Kimberly Freeman's books, um, but I hadn't read this one. This one's called Ember Island and um, set on Morton Island across um, sort of in the late 1800s and then also in the 1900s. She does, you know, uh, parallel narratives or dual timelines really well. And, um, yes, yeah, so I've just started that. And so always good to dig up one of your favourite writers books from the past if you haven't got around to it and if they've got some you haven't read that's the best yeah thing. such a such a joy isn't it you're like oh yeah. that's what I haven't got <laughs> so thank you everybody for coming along tonight thank you for our uh, people our panelists for coming along as always and to our guests who have been in the audience listening along there and of course big thank you to Jessica for giving up some time tonight to come and chat with us about your book and for writing it in the first place uh, we loved it and we think everyone should go and read it. So thank My you pleasure. Very... Thanks, everybody. Thank and next you. month we are actually talking about me and my book. The yeah. Jam Queens is out next month. <laughs> Can't believe that. <laughs> and um, I think Mary Lou is actually going to, uh, I'll come on, say hi, and then I think Mary Lou is going to direct the questions my way so that I can drink cocktails and uh, <laughs> celebrate and have a little party that night. So if you would like to come along to that, you're most welcome. That is on the 13th of April. Thank you, everybody. It's always great to have you here. And we'll see you again next month. Bye. Everyone. Bye. Bye.